Isang magandang mabuhay sa inyong lahat, Mati 21! Today, we'll be learning about mechanical failure. Okay, bago tayo magsimula, ano nga ba ang failure? What is failure? Sa madaling salita, ang failure ay yung pag hindi mo nagawa ang gusto mo. Sa ating mga materials, ang failure is sinidefine natin bilang pag yung materials mo is hindi nag-perform dun sa kanyang specific application. So, the failure of materials, this leads to consequences. So, pwedeng masira yung gamit mo or pwedeng mas grabe pa siya. Pwede kang magkaroon ng loss of life, pwede kang magkaroon ng severe economic losses or pwede kang magkaroon ng damage in the environment. So, that's why we study how our materials fail. So, para makita natin, ah, baka pwede natin prevent to o pwede natin mapahaba yung buhay ng materials mo. So, these are just some examples of material failure in which cause na nagkaroon tayo ng losses in your material. So, yan. Nag-fail yung mga materials mo. Kita nyo naman siya. So, the failure of materials, one of the primary ways in your material in which your material fails is fracture. So, yung fracture, usually nakita natin yan in your metals, in your ceramic, pag nag-crack sila until mag-separate sila into two. So, the fracture is the breaking of a material into two or more pieces. This happens when a crack propagates and splits the material into two or more parts. So the stages of the fracture, first is the formation of your crack, the crack nucleation or formation. Then we have the propagation of the crack, so lahaba yung crack mo, lalaki siya, until mag-reach siya dun sa end and mag-fracture yung material mo, masira na siya completely. So, paano ba nagsisimula ang crack? Saan nang gagaling ang crack? Well, ang mga crack natin, pwede siyang manggaling mula sa mga defects sa mga materials mo. So, like dislocations or impurities inside your materials. Also, pwede rin siyang manggaling from the environment. So, pwede ma-influence ng environment yung material mo, such that dun magsisimula yung cracks mo. So, examples niyan is corrosion, para pag nag yung metal mo or thermal stresses, heat on your material. Pwede rin is magkaroon tayo ng damage in the in service yung material mo. So, nangyayari yan in your moving parts and in other materials in their application. So, pwedeng impact, pwedeng fatigue, or pwedeng merong sudden and unexpected load. So, kunyari may meteor na biglang tumama dun sa bridge mo, na-expect natin mag yung bridge mo. Magkakaroon ng crack, then mag-fracture. And lastly, pwede rin siya maging design-related. So, mula pa lang dun sa pag-design ng material mo, ah, uh, or nung gamit mo, nung part mo, may mali na na-consider. So, minsan, mali dimensions, may mga, uh, meron tayong features in your design that would, uh, na magpapalaganap ng crack mo, such as sharp corners, grooves, niches, and voids in your material. So, in our material, we have generally two types of fracture. So, yung nasa kaliwa, this is your ductile fracture. So, ductile fracture, ganito yung itsura niya, cup and cone failure. While, yung nasa kanan, this is your brittle fracture, makita mo mas smooth yung surface natin. There is little to no plastic deformation. So, pag ductile, you have plastic deformation, plastic deformation here and here. Sa, so, eto, nakita nyo, meron ditong neck. Meanwhile, sa brittle fracture mo, Halos wala kang plastic deformation. Sudden lang siya nag-break. So, this is ductile versus brittle fracture. So, ductile fracture mo again, you have plus, uh, you have you have plastic deformation. Plastic deformation. Dito, you have no plastic uh, deformation. So, now let's look at our ductile fracture. So, this is characterized by plastic deformation near the fracture site or in the vicinity of an advancing crack. So, in your metals under tensile load, makita natin yan as yung necking phenomena natin. So, this is a generally slow process. Uh, this crack is termed to be stable. Pag stable yung crack mo, sinasabi natin na hindi siya nag advance unless meron kang enough stress to dislodge the crack or to lengthen the crack. So, ang general feature nito, when under tensile load, makita natin you have your cup and cone uh, feature. So, you have cup and cone features. So, this shows na meron kang extensive 
plastic deformation before fracture. So yan, pag ganyan nakita nyo, you have ductal fracture. So for the stages of ductal fracture, you have five. First, you have the initial necking caused by the application of your stress. Next, you form small cavities. So ito yung mga microvoids natin due to uh, defects in the materials like impurities. Then, these voids or these cavities will uh, coalesce into a crack. Magsasama-sama sila. This will propagate. And magkakaroon tayo ng fracture by eh, and then tayo ng fracture by shear deformation. So makita natin yung fracture propagation mode will be 45 degrees to the axis of the tensile load. So shown in the figure is a common fracture surface for ductal fracture. So we have the fibrous zone here at the center. Emanating outwards from that is the radial zone. Then sa labas, you have your shear lip zone. So, mula dito sa figure na to, we can see that our crack started from the center. Because the location or the center of the fibrous zone, this essentially tells us where the crack uh, originated. Then, magpapagit siya to the radial zone. And once mawalan na ng ability yung material mo na, mas, na ma-hold pa yung structure niya or ma-hold yung stress, magkakaroon siya ng catastrophic failure in which makita natin, makakarakterize yung shear lip zone mo. And shown here, sa kaliwa, this is a fractograph of your uh, ductile fracture. Makita natin this sa fibrous zone mo and sa radial zone. Here, sorry, here, sa fibrous zone, medyo roughing surface mo. Then once you go out, outwards, smooth na yung fracture mo. So pag Meron kang rough surface, usually, this is a characteristic of a ductile fracture because allowed yung crack mo propagate transgranularly, uh, intergranularly, or in the grain boundaries. Next, for the brittle fracture, we can see that there is little plastic deformation found. It's a very rapid process. Nagpara nag snap lang siya into two, wala ng plastic deformation na kita. And the crack propagation is termed to be unstable it would move spontaneously even without additional stress applied to your material. So, this results in a flat fracture surface. So, pag nakita mo perfectly flat yung fracture mo, this is a characteristic of a brittle fracture. So, in materials, which do you think is the type of fracture that is preferred? So, I would let you, I would give you some time to think about this. So, pause here. And if you are ready to answer, just unpause it. So I'll count down to from 5. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So the answer is ductal fracture. So ductal fracture is preferred since nakita natin na gumagalaw or nakita natin yung pag-deform ng material mo before siya mag -fail. So it's not sudden we can remedy the situation or we can replace the part. So ductile fracture is more preferred than brittle fracture every time. Well, most of the time. There are some applications in which gusto mag brittle fracture siya, but we're not going to go into that one. So in terms of crack propagation, we have two different routes. First is our transgranular fracture in which your crack propagates uh, in the grains. Counterpart to that, you have your intergranular fracture. Pag intergranular fracture naman, your crack propagates on the grain boundaries. So, whether or not transgranular or intergranular yung fracture natin depends on the type of stress applied and whether or not mas stronger yung grain boundaries natin or yung grain surface mo. So, there are a lot of different, um, make a lot of factors that we consider. So, itong transgranular versus intergranular fracture nyo, ma-learn nyo naman siya in a higher math e-subject. At room temperature, your grain boundaries are usually stronger than your grains. So, from this, we can see that at room temperature, yung preferred method or yung preferred mechanism ng ating crack propagation would be through transgranular fracture since uh, weaker nga yung grains natin than your grain boundaries. So, mas gustong gumalaw ni crack through our grains. 
Looking at the atomic scale, the mechanism of fracture happens through the breaking of our bonds. So, meron tayong tinatawag na cohesive force. Your cohesive force is a function of the separation or the bond length, bond distance between your atoms. Essentially, to break the bonds between two atoms, we must apply a force greater than the cohesive force of your atoms. Or we must apply a force greater than this sigma max here. Pag mas mataas yung force na apply natin than the bond force or the bonding force between your atoms, we have a very good chance of breaking that bond, leading to the fracture of your material, possible fracture. So the theoretical cohesive strength of a material can be approximated as one-tenth of the elastic modulus of your material. But as we've seen before, the strength of a material is much less than this theoretical cohesive strength due to defects in your material. This is due to the uh, phenomena which we call stress concentration. When we have a crack, nagkakaroon ng tendency na in this region here, in this crack here, yung stress na may experience niya would be much higher than the applied stress in the material. So flaws increase the stress in their vicinity. We can think of it as if sinasalo nung atoms na nandito, nandito sa ating crack tip, yung force na dapat sinasalo nung bonds na nandito, pero dahil wala sila, lahat pupunta dito sa crack tip na to. Kaya malaki yung stress na na-experience niya in that region. So at the crack tip, we experience what we call your stress concentration. The maximum stress that is experienced at this crack tip is given by the following equation. Uh, sigma m, or the maximum stress, equal to 2 times sigma naught, where sigma naught is the applied stress, times a over rho t, raised to 1 half, where a is the crack length, and rho t is the radius of the curvature of the tip. So depending on whether or not the crack is an internal or external crack, magde-depend yung value ng A natin. Pag external crack yung ating crack, the length of the crack is termed to be just A. If internal crack yung crack natin, then that length is equal to 2A. So now think about this. For the same crack length and radius, which will cause fracture faster? A crack inside your material, an internal crack, or a crack outside your material, external crack. So I'll give you five seconds to answer that, or you may pause the video. So five, four, three, two, one. So the answer is an external crack would cause fracture faster. So kaya yung mga serrations natin usually meron yan sa labas. So an external crack would cause a fracture faster because the external crack mo isang bond lang essentially yung nag ho hold ng stress. So kunwari we have these two cracks here. Imagine na same length sila. So it's applied to the same amount of stress. Dito sa left side din sa external crack mo. Isang bond lang yung nag-hold nitong buong stress mo. Pero dito sa isa sa internal crack mo, it is held by two tips of the crack. So more stress yung kayang ma shoulder nung internal crack mo than your external crack since mas marami yung kaya mag shoulder sa kanya. Simple. So, thinking about how your crack would propagate, makita natin learning about your stress concentration, the stress that is shouldered by the crack tip, we would see that for a crack to propagate, yung stress at the crack tip must be greater than your theoretical stress. Theoretical strength of your material. Sorry. So, ginawa to ni Griffith as a criterion. So, dinistate niya lang in another way. In crack propagation, the energy consumed in forming a new surface is equal to the elastic energy released. So, for a crack to propagate, for fracture to happen, the rate of energy release should be greater than the rate of energy consumption. Or, parang sinabi niya that your crack 
would propagate when the decrease in the elastic strain or yung energy na release natin is greater than the energy na ginagamit ng material mo to create new surfaces. So the critical stress needed to propagate your crack would be dependent on the elastic modulus of your material and the surface energy of your material. The critical stress for fracture propagation will be equal to the square root of 2 times the elastic modulus times your surface energy over pi A, where A is the length of the crack. So if this critical stress is exceeded, your crack will propagate. But this does not ensure that your fracture would occur because you, first, you also need to learn whether or not your material is ductile or brittle. So now let's look at an example for Griffith's criterion. So a relatively large plate of glass is subjected to a tensile stress of 40 megapascals. If the specific surface energy and modules of elasticity for this glass are 0.3 joules per meter squared and 69 gigapascals respectively, now let's determine the maximum length of a surface flow that is possible without fracture. So in this case, we're determining the length of our crack in the surface. So kanina, you have an equation relating your critical stress and your uh, elastic modulus, your surface energy, and your length of the crack. Using that equation, we can manipulate that one so we get A, or yung crack length na unknown sa atin, well, we have A is equal to 2 times E gamma S over pi sigma squared. So, lalagay natin lahat nung ating given. So, E or our elastic modulus is 69 gigapascal. Our surface energy is 0 0.3 joules per meter squared. And your tensile stress is 40 MPa. So, we're looking for the length of the crack before that can withstand this stress without fracture, putting it in this equation, we would get that it would be 8.2 micrometers or 8.2 microns. Or, makita natin, malit na crack lang, pwede nang mag-fracture uh, yung glass natin. So, we have a parameter which we call your fracture toughness, Kc. And this Kc is equal to y times sigma c times square root of pi a. Fracture toughness, or Kc, is used to determine the material's resistance to brittle fracture. Where y is a dimensional para dimensionless parameter, which depends on the crack size, specimen size, and the manner of loading. So we usually have a table of values for this y. Sigma c is your critical stress from Griffith's criterion, and a is the length of the crack. So makita natin from here, and from this equation, your Kc will depend on y and sigma c and a, which will in turn make your fracture toughness dependent on the temperature, the strain rate, and the microstructure of your material. So fracture toughness usually have the units MPa times square root of m or PSI square root of inches. So this is... Uh, stress times length raised to one half. So the fracture toughness of different materials are shown in this table. So metals usually have the highest toughness followed by ceramics and polymers. In the propagation of your cracks, you also have three modes for the displacement of your crack or through the movement of your crack. First, we have your tensile mode, or this is the opening mode. You have your sliding, or your in-plane shear mode, and you have your tearing, or your out-of-plane shear mode. So between these three, which do you think would be the most common? Correct. So the most common is yung ating tensile mode. Since most of our stresses, makita natin pag nag-open siya, Pag nag-open yung crack mo, usually, tensile yung behavior. Rin-rip apart natin yung bonds natin due to a tensile stress. So looking at the fracture toughness, we can see that there will be different factors that affect 
this fracture toughness for our material. First is the type of stress applied to our material. So various stresses create different responses in your material. So an example of this is your ceramic. We know that for a glass, for glass, mas madaling mag-break yung material mo or yung glass mo when we subject it into tensile stress rather than compressive stress. That's one example. Next, you have your strain rate. If mas mabilis yung strain rate mo, the fracture toughness of your materials decrease or it is more susceptible to fracturing since we're not giving our dislocations enough time to move about. Hence, there's no plastic deformation, bringing us as to fracture. So now for temperature, if we increase our temperature, we increase the fracture toughness. Consequently, if you decrease the temperature, you also decrease the fracture toughness of your material. This is due to the increase in the lattice friction of your material as the temperature decreases makes fracture makes plastically deforming the material harder making fracture easier in some materials makita natin that there will be a transition from a ductile fracture mode to a brittle fracture mode so merokan temperature which we call the ductile to brittle transition temperature which can be observed in some structures na bcc and hct so look so, in ductile to brittle transition natin, makita natin na your material under some temperature would transition from a ductile mode to a brittle mode of fracture. Lumiliit yung available toughness or toughness niya to withstand failure. So, shown here in this slide is the same type of metal under the same strain rate, but ang nagkaiba lang is yung testing temperature nila. So, from the top left to the bottom right, we are decreasing in temperature. So, 373 Kelvin, 293 Kelvin, 143 Kelvin, and 77 Kelvin for the four different sites. And makita natin, as we decrease our temperature, nagkakaroon tayo ng more brittle na failure. So, the brittleness of the failure can be shown or manifested by the size of the shear lip zone. If walang tayong masyadong makitang shear lip, essentially, little na lang yung plastic deformation natin before fracture, which makes it more brittle. So, as we decrease our temperature, there would be a transition from ductile to brittle in our steel. So, makita natin mababa yung toughness ng ating material. So this happens in some materials BCC and HCP since essentially finifreeze natin yung mga slip planes ng material mo. Tinatanggal natin yung capability ng material mo to plastically deform, then they would rather crack or fracture, making them brittle. So this ductile to brittle transition is one of the culprits or the primary culprit behind yung most famous shipwreck in history, yung Titanic. So, Titanic natin, this water, yung water natin dito, this is cold. Very cold. May iceberg doon. Dahil doon, sobrang cold ng water mo, naging brittle yung steel mo. Kaya nung tumama siya sa iceberg mo, nasira agad yung hull mo, nag-split siya into two, and namatay si Jack and si Rose. So, other factors affecting fracture toughness is the presence of volume defects. So, these defects lower the available area for your material to absorb stress. And, or, and this also introduces stress concentrators into your material, lowering the toughness of your material. We also have the effects of the environment. One is hydrogen embrittlement. Hydrogen embrittlement is when hydrogen atoms seep into your metals making them more brittle. So the mechanism of this one will be taught to you in Math E171. And we also have the effect of corrosion. So corrosion in your material would uh, give sites for stress to be concentrated. So basically, you form ka ng cracks due to corrosion, which under some stress would cause fractures. So basically, you hina yung material mo due to the corrosion. 
to assess the toughness of your material, one of the most widely used tests in our materials engineering field is the impact testing. So in impact testing, we get what we call your impact strength. Impact strength is the amount of energy that a material can absorb before fracturing under a high rate of deformation. So we use impact testers, which just uh, drop a load from a high position down to a low position. So mula siya dito, start siya here, bababa siya, and it will strike your material in this bottom here. So magkakaroon ka ng impact, and if enough yung energy na yun, if enough to, kakaroon ka ng end ng swing niya hanggang dito. So, ito yung height niya after, height niya before. So, parang siyang pendulum. But some of the energy would be absorbed by the material. So, yung strength ng material natin will just be the difference between this height and this height. So, it will be h1 minus h2 times the mass of your hammer and the acceleration due to gravity. Simple. So, so in impact testing, it is important we, that we have what we call a notch in our specimens. Itong notch na to, this is yung parang source or yung stress concentration point in which we start yung ating fracture. So, dependent on the material or the testing, meron tayong two different modes na pwedeng gawin. Meron tayong on Sharpie and your EZ mode. So, Sharpie mode, your hammer strikes the material at the point of the notch. So, this is more severe. Mas mataas yung impact energy in the Sharpie mode. Meanwhile, sa isod mode natin, yung hammer natin strikes some distance away from the notch. This is less severe. There is relatively lower impact energy in your material. So, depending on the type of material, you may employ either the Sharpie or the Ezod modes. So, the impact testing natin is will be further discussed in a higher math subject. So, we also have what we call hardness. The hardness is just the resistance of a material to a localized plastic deformation. So, examples of this is indentation, scratching, abrasion, and so on. So, um, the hardness test is made by the penetration of our material with an indenter. So, indenter natin, usually, this is a very hard material kasi kailangan natin ma-penetrate nga or mag-cause ng plastic deformation in our test material. So, the hardness testing is commonly perform, performed because it is simple and inexpensive. There's is non-destructive, maliit lang na region ng material mo yung test natin. And from the hardness, you can usually measure or estimate other properties of the material, such as the strength of the material. So this is MOS hardness, MOS scale of mineral hardness. Diamond is the hardest, talcum is the lowest. Ito yung pinag-aralan nyo nung high school or elementary kayo. And yung MOS scale natin, this is just a qualitative scale, so we don't really have values. In materials engineering, we don't usually use the MOS scale other than the appreciation of hardness or comparing which material is harder than the other, we need quantitative value. In materials engineering, we have more quantitative ways to measure your hardness. So shown in this slide is just some uh, of the quantitative ways that we can measure. We have your Brinell testing, Vickers testing, and Rockwell testing. So itong different modes na to, this is essentially just indents your material with different indenters depending on the testing kung anong indenter ginagamit nila. And you can then measure the hardness from the size of the indentation or the depth of the indentation formed in your material. So the mechanism of this one will be explained to you in a higher materials engineering course. So another type of material failure is where Wear is just when your material loses some of itself or some of its material on the surface due to the contact of that material with other interfaces or surfaces. So shown here are just some examples of wear in your material. So usually pwede siya abrasion, pwede through erosion or through adhesion yung mechanism ng wear natin. Pero 
So, yung pinakoma na example dyan is yung pagliliha or pagsasandpaper ng mga bagay-bagay natin. So, another uh, mechanism of material failure is through fatigue. So, our fatigue, this is a form of failure that occurs due to dynamic and fluctuating stresses. So, hindi lang stagnant yung stress mo, hindi siya static. Nag-iiba yung value ng stress mo. This occurs, or the failure of fatigue occurs at stresses lower than the yield stress. And due to the application of these repetitive stresses, the failure would occur after a long time in which we subjected our material to this type of stress. So in materials engineering, we usually study fatigue since this is the most common type of failure that happens in your metals. 90% of failures in your metals happen through fatigue. This is a very catastrophic failure, occurs in a brittle-like manner with very little gross plastic deformation. And due to this, it occurs very suddenly without warning, making the consequences or the effect of fatigue really, really bad. Because we don't know that your material is going to fail until it fails. So one example of fatigue is your Aloha Airlines Flight 243 in which nausira yung fuselage natin. Nawala siya during, I think, takeoff yata yan. So due to the pressurization the pressurization that happens during takeoff and landing, meron kang cycle netong stresses na to. And at such a point, hindi na kaya nung fuselage mo. Meron kang lap joint in the fuselage that hindi na kaya ma withstand yung fatigue natin, nag-break off na lang siya after mag-take off yung airplane natin. Though, amazingly, in this flight, isa lang yung casualty natin, I think, meron lang isang flight attendant na hinigo palabas ng airplane. Pero iba, dahil sa seatbelts, naka-survive naman sila. So, let's just differentiate between static and dynamic loading. Pag static yung loading mo, your load is constant. Meanwhile, pag dynamic yung loading mo, your load is varying. So, nag-iiba-iba yung stress na na-apply sa kanya. Static load is like yung pillar natin. Alam natin kung ano yung load na na-apply sa kanya. Dynamic is yung stress na na-apply sa bridge mo. Ito pala sa baba. Since may times na mas mataas yung traffic, mas mataas yung stress na apply sa kanya, minsan walang na-apply yung stress sa kanya, and so on. So, fatigue is usually encountered in parts or applications in which dynamic loading is experienced. One is in revolving parts such as crankshafts, gears, axles, and propellers since umiikot siya. You have dynamic continuous loading. We also have fatigue in bridges and spans since nag-iiba yung loads niya depende dun sa number of cars or dun sa pagpas ng cars and other vehicles in your bridge and we also have the skins and the wings of our planes due to the pressurization and the pressurization that happens during takeoff and landing. So we can differentiate failure by fracture and by fatigue by looking at the fracture surface of your material. If the fracture surface looks something like this, so makita natin yung fibrous zone, radial, and shear lip zone mo. This is usually your fracture na failure. Pag fatigue, your surface is much more smoother. Magkakaroon ka ng mastriations na ganito. So we call those your beach marks. And these usually emanate from one point, usually in the surface or some internal flow here. So pag ganito yung nakita mo, usually this is a fatigue failure. So, so fatigue, you have three different stages of failure. You have your crack initiation, crack propagation, and your final brittle fracture. So first, your crack is initiated in a nucleation point. It usually is in the surface of your material. Then your cracks propagate slowly outward from that crack nucleation point until hindi na kaya mo sustain ng material mo yung stress and magkakaroon ka na ng brittle fracture dito. So for fatigue to occur, the requirement is that your material is subjected to what we call a cyclic stress. So the applied stresses may be either axial, so pwede kang tensile and compress yung hilahin, i-compress, hilahin, i-compress. You have your flexural or your bending or your torsional or your twisting 
uh, stresses. So as shown in this figure. So shown in the slide is a fatigue tester. So essentially dito, we're applying a cyclic stress to your material and we're counting the number of times that we apply the specific cyclic stress to our material para malaman yung lifetime or yung ability ng ating material to withstand failure through fatigue. So to determine the material's properties under fatigue, we usually construct the SN curve of your material. So we can get the fatigue properties from lab simulation testing such as fatigue testing as seen in the previous slide. We subject your material to different levels of stresses. Then we plot the number of cycles before failure versus the stress of the cycle. So an example of an SN curve is shown in this slide. In this slide, we, we plotted the amplitude of the stress, amplitude of the stress versus the cycles to failure n. So this is usually in the logarithmic scale or log scale. And makita natin that as your stress increases, the stress amplitude increases, mas konti lang cycles ang kaya ng material mo. And as we decrease your stress, dumadami yung cycles before your materials fails. In some materials, we have what we call your fatigue limit or endurance limit. So in this fatigue limit, if we apply stress lower than this fatigue limit, makita natin that your material would not fail under fatigue, under, uh, will not experience fatigue if you apply that constant stress amplitude. So for steels, the fatigue limit is 35% to 60% of your tensile strength. So this, this fatigue limit or endurance limit phenomena is usually uh, exhibited by our steels. So another type of SN curve is observed in alloys that are non-ferrous. So dito wala tayong fatigue limit. So in this SN curve, we can extract two different data, yung ating fatigue strength and fatigue life. Yung fatigue strength natin, this is expressed relative to the number of cycles of your material. So for example, we're looking for the fatigue strength at 10 to the 7 cycles since we're expecting that in your material's lifetime it would undergo 10 to the 7 cycles of that repetitive stress. Makita natin that your stress, fatigue strength at that one is at this level here. Meron din tayong fatigue life in which we are looking for the amount of cycles that your material can withstand at a given stress amplitude. So in this case, the fatigue life at S1 is in this point here. So this again is observed for non-ferrous alloys. And lastly, the last form of failure of your materials is your creep. So creep is defined as a time-dependent and permanent deformation of materials when subjected to constant stress or load. For metals, it becomes important at a temperature greater than 0.4 of its melting temperature. So creep only becomes important in very high temperature applications such as in furnace support, steam turbines, and your jet engine turbines since usually nasa elevated temperature yung operation nila. So to test our materials for creep, we usually use a UTM or a universal testing machine under a furnace or an elevated temperature. So this yields us our creep curve. So in this case, ang ginagawa natin is we're holding our material in a constant stress. I mean, measure natin yung strain natin with respect to time under at an elevated temperature. So from the creep curve, we can uh, see different stages of creep. You have your primary, secondary, and tertiary stages. So the primary creep, makita natin your strain rate decreases with time. And to such a point, mag equalize siya when in which you would undergo secondary creep. So secondary creep is your strain rate is a steady state value and it's minimum. And after which, mag rupture na yung material mo after undergoing tertiary creep in which the strain rate increases with time. 
So, creep, fatigue, fracture, and our other failures of our materials, this will be further explained in your Math E 171. So, with that, uh, let's just look at stress and temperature effects. So, if we increase the temperature or the stress of your material, we expect that the lifetime of your material or the resistance of the, of the material to creep would decrease. It would undergo less time before it would uh, fail. So with that, we end our discussion regarding the fracture of materials or the failure of our materials. So for any questions or comments, so you can reach me through phone, email, or through the comment section. So with that, I bid you good day and hope you are all keeping sane. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.